Welcome to the Christian Church on a Sunday afternoon, August the 31st, 2014. I thank God for allowing me to see another day. I thank God for allowing us to get make it through the month of August. And we look forward, it should the Lord allow, for us to see wonderful things in the month of September as well. God has been so gracious to us. He has given us the opportunity to come to preach the gospel each and every week by his grace that he allows us to. And I just thank God and I'm humbled by the opportunity to minister and to use the giftings that God has given me for his glory and not my own. Amen. I am just a piece or part of a much larger body, the body of Christ has nothing to do with what church you affiliate with. It matters if you are born again and that you love Jesus. God is calling his body to something different, which means we're to be unique from the world. So many people are conforming to the things of this world and still calling themselves the body of Christ. They are sadly mistaken. Jesus said his sheep know his voice and a stranger shall they not follow. So the only thing I can do is agree with what God has already said in his word. Amen. I can't come up with some new doctrine to try to lead people. I must stay true to the truth of the word of God. And the word of God must guide what I teach, not me trying to teach something and try to find things in the word to justify me teaching them. Amen. It's a big difference because when you're being led of the spirit, you will not err. Amen. Whereas if you try to come in your own intellect and your own knowledge and arguments, you will always find an error in the midst. But when we trust God, we will not come into error. And if we love God and we ourselves find ourselves erring because of something we said or did or believed, we humble ourselves, we confess our sins to God, and God is faithful and just to forgive us of all our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So we have no excuse to live unrighteously when the righteousness of the word of God and power of the Holy Ghost and truth of the gospel is so freely delivered to us. Amen. And we started last week in Titus chapter 2. We did not finish Titus chapter 2. So I'm going to go back and read the whole chapter, but we'll pick up from parts and then we'll get right into Titus chapter 3 because God says that a person that is a leader whether they are bishop or an elder they use those examples but it also represents any type of leadership whether you're in your home on your job or wherever you are if you have to lead you you must be leading according to the character of the Word of God if you're a Christian doesn't matter if you have a secular job. If you are a Christian, you must lead according to the Bible. So if someone fires you for standing up for the truth, you need to know that God is going to reward you for being faithful to him as opposed to someone who compromises just to get along with man, but they must give an account when they stand before God. Amen. This is a serious thing in God in your home. Your home is your ministry. If you're a man of God, then it starts right here. We happen to preach the gospel here because God has given me the grace to do so. But if you're in a church that's much larger, God doesn't care about the size. He cares about the holiness of the people there. Amen. You can be in a big church that's lost and without God and has turned unto their own ways and it'll do you no good when you stand before God. Or you can be in a place like this where there's just a small gathering, but if our hearts are in tune to what God is saying, God can do, he has big things in small packages. Amen. Mm -hmm. God doesn't need size to accomplish his will. All he needs is faithfulness. Amen. Titus chapter 2. I'll start off at the beginning and we'll get back into where we need to be. It says, but speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. 
that means things that are true. If your gospel or your doctrine is not true, it is not the true gospel of the word. It doesn't matter how much it has truth mixed in. If it has error in it, then you're not teaching sound doctrine. Amen. It says, let the age, it says that the aged men be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, and charity and patience. The aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as become of holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things. Amen. Verse 4, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands that the word of God be not blasphemed. And we talked about that. We said if a man is not following Christ correctly, he is not in a proper place to lead properly. Amen. If you're a woman, you want to be following a man that loves God. And if your husband isn't, you pray for him. And you lift up the truth of the gospel and you say, you know, in order for our home to be a happy home the way God wants it to be, we need to be walking in step with what the Bible says. We can't be divided and think that things are going to, to work out the way we intend them to be. A house divided against itself, Jesus said, cannot stand. So... In order for the home to stand, in order for there to be harmony in the marriage, husband and wife should be following God. If that's the case, then the woman can follow the man's lead if the man is following Christ's lead. Amen? That's the only way it's going to be successful. And when we do things contrary, it causes people to point at, at God. Because, see, God set up marriage. And he said, what God put together, let no man... Uh, put us under you understand what God joins together but see a lot of marriages have torn up because of the sin that takes place in the marriage that leads to the divorce God hates divorce but he does not hate divorced people as some people teach and if you end up in another marriage you know those things can be confessed to God and God can take that second marriage and turn it around and make it something that is beautiful. God's not going to condemn you just like he didn't condemn the woman at the well that had been married five times. Yeah. But once she turned around and God gave her the Holy Ghost, I'm pretty sure that she went out and did the right thing. Mm -hmm. And we'll find out when we get to heaven whether she did or whether she didn't. Because if she didn't, she won't be there. But if she did, she will be there. And I believe the story has a good ending. It says, young men likewise, exhort to be sober-minded in all things, showing thyself a pattern of good works and doctrine, showing uncorruptness. That means you can't have corruptness in your teaching like many churches have. They're mixing truth with error, and they have corruption going on, and they don't even know it or, or they don't want to face up to the reality. And people want to just ignore it, thinking it's going to go away. Showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity. That means you must be sincere. But you must be sincerely on the right path. Because you can be sincerely wrong if you get off the path. And see, some people think if you ignore all the errors and all the wrong stuff going on in the church and just concentrate on that which is good, that's all that matters. Wrong, it's not going to go anywhere. Just like if you take a rug and you lift up that rug and you take all the dirt that's in the floor that you swept up in a pile and you pile it under the rug, what's going to happen to that rug eventually? The rug's going to be up like this, like a mountain, and the pile of dirt is going to be underneath of it, and eventually the rug will fall off. You can't keep sweeping things under the carpet, amen? amen. It's going to come out and everybody's going to see the dirtiness. But when you sweep it into a pile and you throw it away, then guess what? Your floor is clean and there's no pile of dirt sitting up, you know, sitting in the middle of the floor because you haven't covered it. You've disposed of it. We must dispose of wickedness so that the churches can be a place that you can truly call the house of the Lord when God's people are there. Amen. 
and there's no corruption and wickedness going on in that place that calls itself a church of Jesus Christ. Verse 8, sound speech that cannot be condemned, that he that is of the contrary sort may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say of you. That means when people treat you wrong and stab you in the back and talk about you and slander your name, if you stay true to the word of God, God will cause those people to be ashamed one day. Whether in this life and they repent or in the afterlife when they end up in hell and they have eternal shame and they wish they could get one more chance to make it right and it's too late because God has given us space to repent while we're alive. No repentance beyond the grave. You understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Don't believe anybody or any cult like the Jehovah's Witnesses that tell you that if you don't get it right, you'll have another chance when Jesus comes back. Now when Jesus comes back, your chances is over. You understand what I'm saying? You got to get it right now and get out of those false teachings and get into true Christianity, which is following Jesus, who is the son of Jehovah God. And they, too, along with the Holy Ghost, which is three, make one. They don't believe in the Trinity. We do. We believe in the Holy Trinity of God. And we know that there are counterfeits, but there's also a true. No counterfeit can take the place of the true and living God. Amen. It says not purloining. We talked about that last week, meaning you're not a thief. And we know that most of the jobs suffer loss out here. Most of the loss comes from employee theft where people are stealing from companies that they're supposed to be working for. God doesn't doesn't condone that and he'll judge people who don't repent of that not purloining but showing all good fidelity meaning faithfulness that they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things for the grace of God that bringeth salvation have appeared to all men that means everybody has the opportunity to be saved by God's grace if they're willing and it's only by God's grace that we're saved it's not because of our goodness, because our goodness can't get rid of our badness. You understand what I'm saying? You can't do enough good things to, oh, to wash away your sins. That's why Jesus came and died on the cross for you. Now we're getting into the new information of the day. And we're going to verse 13. And I'm taking my time because if I can explain it to you and you can understand, then you're going to be able to grow by what I teach and preach. Not rushing through it so that I can get to something else, but staying here until we get it clear, and then I can move on to what God may have me to do in the future. Amen? But this is important so that you know that when you come to a church, you must judge that church according to the fruit that it's bearing. If you've got corrupt people and people that are envious and fighting for positions in the church, then you do not have a place where you're going to be able to grow properly spiritually. You understand what I'm saying? All it's going to be is a bunch of envy and strife. And the Bible says in James chapter 3, it says where jealousy and envy are, there is confusion in every evil work. So you'll see all kinds of inside stuff going on while they put on a show outside looking like there's something that's holy. There's a lot of junk that goes on behind the scenes. And God sees it, and he's telling us not to be envious and jealous of one another. Amen? Verse 13 says, looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ. We talked about that in the rapture and the marriage supper of the Lamb that we know that Jesus is going to appear in glory to take his church away. Those who truly belong to him will be rescued from this evil world. Amen? Uh, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. That means the work that cleanses our hearts, our souls, our minds, and our bodies is being led by the power of God and through Christ, not in our own strength. Amen? 
so that Jesus can make us pure. Therefore, we can be perfect in the eyes of God if we follow Jesus and allow his righteousness to cleanse us. It's not in and of ourselves, but it's through him. Because when he sees us, he said he's going to present a glorious church without spot or wrinkle. So that means, yes, you can. You can live holy. That doesn't mean you're flawless. You may have flaws, but God's going to take away all your flaws and give you a glorified body. Amen. Wow. We're not condemned to these bodies forever. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Don't know about you, but I like to get out of this body and get into a glorified body. Amen? <laughs> but only in the, as it relates to the timing and the will of God. I have to serve God right where I am because his strength is made perfect through weakness. Amen? Amen. And his grace Amen. is sufficient for us. We can be encouraged by these things. The Bible says these things speak and exhort. And rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. In other words, don't let nobody talk down on you because you're telling the truth. Don't let people try to shame you and make you think that you're separated from the rest of everybody else because you're preaching in your home, because you're trying to protect your family from all the evil and spiritual abuse and corruption that's going on. Don't let nobody despise the truth of the gospel. That's coming from my lips as I humble myself before God and he empowers me to preach the gospel the way it should be preached and to rebuke the devil in the name of Jesus whenever he raises his ugly head we have the power of the gospel to bring Satan back under subjection and put him under our feet amen that's why we can tell him get thee behind me Satan just like our Lord Jesus told him. Now let's get into Titus chapter number 3. Because there's a lot of wonderful scripture there. But we'll start it off and we'll see how far we get today before I stop. It says, put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers. To obey magistrates. To be ready to every good work. That means we're to respect government. We're to respect those who are in authority. As it relates to the word, we're not to obey anything that's contrary to the word of God. So this isn't telling you to obey the government no matter what they do. If what they're doing is wicked, you got to go in another direction. Amen. And the government can't stop you from serving God if you stay faithful to God, even if they try to threaten you or whatever they try to do. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 10, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might, right? Finally, brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Verse 11, put on the, old, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the walls of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Therefore take unto you the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand in the evil day, and having done all the standing. And it tells you how to put on the armor. Understand that there are rulers of darkness out here that control all of the dark corridors of life but we as Christians we serve Jesus Christ he is the highest authority he is the highest power amen he has all power in heaven and in earth and he has all power over principalities and rulers and, and, and God can redeem you and God can rescue you from anything that the kingdom of darkness throws at you amen but we're to do good and the rulers of this world, as far as the governors and presidents, were supposed to be doing the will of God, not doing their own will. Verse 2, to speak evil of no man, to be no brawlers, but gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. We're to be gentle. We ain't to be out here cussing people out and flipping them the bird and giving them. You, you understand what I'm saying? We're supposed to be treating people we're supposed to be loving our neighbor as ourself. Would you give yourself the finger? 
If you no. wouldn't, why would you give it to your neighbor? Even if they did cut you off on the highway. That doesn't give you the right to point that finger at them. Because you may think you're not telling them they're number one. You understand what I'm saying? You're telling them to go.